Today on Education Forum, an interview with Dr. Ellen Roberts, Interim Assistant Vice President for Academic Affairs. From the studio, high atop Jordan Hall in the College of Education and Health Professions at Columbus State University at Columbus, Georgia, this is Education Forum with your hosts, Jeff Conklin and Greg Blaylock. Welcome to Education Forum. I'm Jeff Conklin here with Greg Blaylock. Today's guest is a person who we've wanted on the show for quite a while and we finally were able to get some time on her schedule to uh, have her on Education Forum. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Ellen Roberts, who is the Interim Assistant Vice President for Academic Affairs here at Columbus State University. Thank you. Welcome, Ellen. We're glad good to, to have you back. on the show. Thank you. Appreciate it. And welcome, Greg. Hey, Jeff. Good to see you. It's, been, uh, it's actually been a while. It's it been has an assignment been. the last couple of weeks. That's so. right. We've been out doing things. That's exactly you know, right. That's right. Well, Ellen, now that we've got you on, let's talk a little bit about you. How long okay. have you been at CSU? I think this is actually my 27th year. Okay. So a long time. Yes, a Long a history here. And and you think you might stay? Or? <laughs> I think I will. <laughs> Maybe work it out, huh? I've always said as long as I enjoy, enjoy what I'm doing, I'm staying. So, good. so, so, good. so, so good. far, so good. So what role did you have when you first came here? I came in in physical education as okay. a program coordinator. There was only an undergraduate degree in place at the time, so mm -hmm. early in those years I was developing that undergraduate program in health and physical education and writing the proposal to get a master's degree, which okay. was important. Oh, yeah. Uh, since the time that I came, I thought graduate studies are important on a campus, mm -hmm. and I really wanted one in my own field, so, okay. so that's what I did. Now, how many faculty were there in PE at the time? Uh, well, the whole department probably only had four or five. Okay. And we were running a recreation program mm -hmm. and uh, a therapeutic recreation program. Okay and a recreation management program and an exercise science program and then health and physical education. So each person had so each person had a program, okay, right. Okay, okay. So we've grown a good bit. And how long did you do that? Uh, a lot of years. Okay. Uh, until 2003 okay. when I came over as the associate dean. Okay. So, yeah. Under Thomas Harrison. Now, why PE? Why that area? Were you an athlete? I was. Okay. I was an athlete. Uh, when I was making a decision uh, at the time that I went to college about what I wanted to study, mm -hmm. I, I looked at what I was good at and what I thought um, was important in terms of what students needed. Okay. And I looked okay. at physical education, I looked at English, mm -hmm. and I looked at math ed. Okay. And, all, uh, all critical. <laughs> and I actually got certified to teach in health and physical education and in psychology and in English. Okay. Yeah. okay. But I took my first job in, in physical education okay. and stayed with it. Now, so, so real quick, you, you were an athlete. Uh, yes. What what sports did you? Uh... You know, in high school, I was mm -hmm. I'm old enough that there were not many choices for for sure. girls. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and I played tennis, and then I went to college and I played tennis and volleyball. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. And then after I took my first job, uh -huh. I added on some coaching responsibilities. So I coached my first year in gymnastics, which I'd never done oh, before. Wow. <laughs> wow. And, uh, and then also did uh, volleyball and track and field, wow. cross country. Wonderful. So, so maybe if, towards the end of the show, you, we can get a balance beam out here. You can show Dr. Conklin <laughs> a few moves some of the moves on the balance beam. Talk about, yeah. He's now, been working talk on about it a long office. shot. Yeah. <laughs> I idea. remember seeing the poster in your office. With the little girl with the tennis, tennis racket. racket. Yes, right. indeed. That's why I love that poster. Yeah, yeah. I still have that poster. Yeah, it was great. Okay, so then you were an athlete, and mm -hmm. then you started teaching, and then you jumped over to administration to become the associate dean. Associate dean in the College of Education before it was health professions. Right. Right. And uh, how long did you do that? Until uh, this past May. And a couple of times, you were also the dean. The interim dean. I was the interim dean. Yeah, yes. yeah. What uh, for those those that aren't familiar with deans' positions or associate deans' positions, how do those two positions work together, and what are the differences in terms of what you do as an associate dean as opposed Hopefully, to a dean? Hopefully, a dean and an associate dean have a real good team, and they divide their responsibilities. the The role of a dean has changed so much just in the last few years. Sure. Uh, the responsibilities that a dean has for fundraising right now, and a lot of external. Uh, involvement including uh, committee work and things with the state and different accrediting groups and there's just, there's just a lot of things going on and uh, my role consistently focused as associate dean 
on the internal aspects. I didn't do the fundraising except when I was an interim dean. Sure. And I had to do that. So it's, so, it's much more focused, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in my observations, on day-to-day -day operations yes. in terms of the college yes. as an associate dean. Which, exactly. Which really speaks to what you're doing, I think, today at the university level. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's so right. the uh, associate dean does a lot of the day-to-day -to, -day to keep it running, and the dean's the figurehead out there meeting people more and than, raising money. More than figurehead, yeah. but okay. certainly. Okay. Okay. Um, but, um, but doing a lot of the external work that the associate dean usually doesn't have to to deal with. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, when we started the show, we weren't clear on your title. Right. <laughs> and, and you said it's an interim assistant vice president of academic affairs. Yes. What about the provost title? I mean, didn't we do away with vice president of academic, or president of academic affairs for a provost title instead? Or Well, uh, Tom Hackett is actually provost and vice president for academic affairs. Okay. So he okay. has both of those hats. I see. And uh, as you know, uh, Tina Butcher is an associate provost for undergraduate studies. Right. Greg Doman, who, who we unfortunately lost uh, in April, right. uh, was the associate provost for graduate studies. Yes. And instead of uh, my stepping right into that role, they gave it a slightly different title okay. during this interim role. And they will be searching, and I think the title then will be again for associate provost for graduate education. Okay. Nice. I'm not absolutely certain that's the title they'll choose, but that's kind of the assumption that gotcha. I have. Gotcha. Okay. Now, you spend a lot of time with graduate studies. That's your True. primary role. And what do you do with that? What, do you, what is your role there? Uh, well, I'm director of the graduate school. Okay. And uh, one of the things that we're trying to do with the graduate school right now is just really reestablish it as a physical presence on the campus. Okay. I don't know if you've been aware that if you, that if you look at the literature, we're set up to be in Tucker Hall. Right. My office right. is in a Tucker Hall. Okay. Right. We had an administrative coordinator there for a while. Yes, yes. And, and haven't had one for a couple of years. Okay. Graduate assistants were there for a while, but mm -hmm. after Greg's passing, uh, they went over to graduate admissions and worked. So ah. people were coming by Tucker Hall and nobody was there. Sure. That doesn't so help. So one of the things we were able to do just recently was hire a very good administrative coordinator okay. who loves uh, special events and things too. So she's going to be a lot more than an admin would be. She's going to be very active in, in the role of, of, the, of the graduate okay. school and its activities. And we have two good graduate assistants that are again housed over in Tucker Hall. So okay. we have that physical presence. We're couple nights a week open until six o'clock so that graduate students can get in there Very during that good. time if they're not Very students. Um, so a lot of things to do with the graduate school are going on right now. Uh, heavy on recruitment okay. during the fall. Okay. That's one of the I things that are coming up. I was wondering what we were doing there. Yeah. But I think you asked originally too about the scope of the responsibilities mm -hmm. and I, I do have oversight for distance learning. Okay. And as you know that's a rapidly growing. That's everything today. Columbus yes State. it is. It is. And I have a few other responsibilities that are um, not keeping me as busy, but occasionally okay. um, um, for the promotion and tenure process, a little bit of oversight for that, um, for the IRB, mm -hmm. um, for the academic affairs portion of curriculum work. Okay. So okay. as you know, so you haven't gotten a, away from curriculum. A, no, I haven't. <laughs> so I'm, I'm the one who's reviewing it before okay. the, before the university curriculum committee meets. Okay. And That's there good. are a few other jobs. You and, know. and we need that oversight, especially with all the sure. changes in the university sure. committee. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, in thinking about uh, the graduate school here at the university, you know, it's, it's generally recognized that the graduate programs are the face of universities across the country. From your perspective. What is the importance of a graduate program? How does that impact a university overall? Uh, that's a great question. One I, uh, um, I look forward to, to being able to address, and I hope that I can articulate this well. One of the reasons I think I'm a good fit in this role is because I do believe so much in the value of graduate studies. Mm -hmm. It brings something to a campus that undergraduate education does not. And it's one of those things that you almost have to experience uh, experience it to understand it. Sure. Um, okay. It gets faculty more involved in their own professions at a level they wouldn't otherwise. You have to stay current because you're always being challenged by graduate students. You have to sure. stay into the research. You have discussions that are at a deeper level than you would otherwise. Mm -hmm. There's sure. an energy about it that undergraduate studies just doesn't seem to have. Right. So sure. uh, I think that's one of the things that it really 
really brings on a personal level to people. Obviously, it does a lot for a community uh, as far as raising the education level of people in the community, allowing sure. them to enhance their incomes, their sure. expertise, uh, those kinds of things too. So That's right. You know, I think uh, one of the, for universities across the country, I think one of the primary missions is to get deep into uh, knowledge itself right. and get at truth with a capital T and, and peel back the layers of an onion, so to speak, sure. uh, when it comes to a particular field. And, and graduate work is really where a lot of that happens, where, as you said, discussions are a lot deeper. Mm -hmm. uh, questions are asked that you wouldn't ask at the undergraduate right. level. But because students and professors are focusing much more deeply within their field on the literature and the practice, it really does provide the opportunity, I think, for the field to advance. And it also seems to eliminate some of the silos we have in our academic uh, departments. And there, there's more interdisciplinary work. Good point, People right. reach out to, to yes. across disciplines to yes. do their research. And that's, that's right. pretty exciting yeah. also. That's right. That's now, right. When we talk about graduate education here at Columbus State, how has it changed in the last five years? What have you seen? It has grown phenomenally. Okay. okay. Um, one of the things that I think CSU has been really good about doing is making strategic decisions okay. about the addition of programs mm -hmm. and what to do to support graduate studies. Okay. So you see us listening to the community and its needs. And we have graduate programs in business yes, that we enhance do. the business community. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of graduate programs in education that enhance the education community right. and meet the needs of the region. We added recently the nursing program at the graduate level, which was big a need. need in our yes. region. So those are the kinds of things that we're doing that mm -hmm. I think have helped have helped a great deal. Where we're located physically helps us sure. because there aren't a lot, a lot of other students, at least within the state of Georgia, for our students to select, right. for our for our population in the region to select. So That's CSU right. we're, we're is convenient yes. for them, mm -hmm. but because of our growing reputation, we're drawing people from elsewhere also, we and are, that's great. We are starting to do more and more of that, yes. Yeah, what's well, interesting, I was in Atlanta just a couple of days ago at a, a two-year college mm -hmm. a, a recruitment fair, and uh, just talking about Columbus State University, and I was, uh, I was surprised how many students up there are familiar with Columbus State, which is 90 minutes south of Atlanta, and how many of them are interested in, in making, in traveling in order to, to, to attend a program. And that's different from what we used to, ha to hear. Right, I would imagine. Right. So well, Columbus State was somewhere, and they didn't know. Ohio. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know what, I, I still get calls like sure. that, people that are in Ohio, and sure. then I keep talking about Georgia requirements, and they're going, why do you keep talking about Georgia? Right, right. <laughs> there. But no. Um, so we've seen growth in those areas, and you're saying that we're supporting the community. How does the community support us? I mean, how's that relationship? You probably saw the headlines in the paper recently I about did. the yep. setting new records for mm -hmm. contributions to uh, the CSU Foundation. Just yesterday. Just yesterday. Yes. Yes. Uh, we have a tremendous group of trustees. We have a tremendous group of donors in the community, alumni, people not associated with the with the institution by their um, past academic associations, sure. I guess, didn't get their degrees with us, but they believe in this institution and, and value what it gives to the community and they're returning. And that happens in a lot of different disciplines specifically too. Mm -hmm. uh, the support for the arts is huge. It and, is. Music. And CSU is very much a part of um, that life in this community. Yes. Uh, so there's there are a lot of reciprocal r relationships between mm -hmm. CSU and the hospitals, between CSU yes. and the business community, and uh, so, it's so that's a great goes relationship. Both way. It yeah. does. Yeah. It you know, really does. For prior to to going to recording this, we were talking just a little bit about um, budget and some of the stuff you have to mm -hmm. deal with in budget. Um, Related to that, capital campaigns for universities over the last several years are taking on a greater importance to the operation of the university. Absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit about why capital campaigns have become much more important? Um, it's not just about extra money for the university any longer, is it? It is not. Um, across the nation and certainly here in Georgia, there are reductions in state funds available mm -hmm. for uh, for universities and for education in general. I don't mean just right. universities because P12 is suffering the same sure, kind yes. of 
of financial losses. So if you're losing those state dollars, you have to make up for them some way or another. And universities are um, asking their, their donors to contribute if they can. They're looking for grant funding. They're looking mm -hmm. for lots of different ways to generate revenue if they can. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, some of the online programs that we have have helped to support the institution. So uh, there are a lot of things that, that, that take place in order to make up for the loss in state funds. But we've got excellent trustees, mm -hmm. and the deans go in, the, diff the different units on campus go in, and, and try to present to them what their needs are. And some of those just resonate with certain members of those trustees who sort of pick up on certain causes that they want to support and, I see. and sure. help find support for. So. Which, so, which is great. I mean, have that kind of support out of your community. Right. I mean, it that's is. everything. It so is. it's and in the last campaign that we were just talking about, 8.1 million, as I right. recall, which is our largest one ever. Right. And, and as you know, with the um, the annual fund campaign too, we've we've had more faculty getting involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and that's resonated well with with donors also. Uh, your particular college education and health professions had a lot of faculty show up to do that, mm -hmm. and increases in the amount of money given as a result. Yes. So I think that's something maybe other colleges will be following suit on a little bit more. That would be hope, great. I hope yeah. that this one will will do the same. Good, good. You know, and and you were mentioning the funding. Today, it's as, as Greg had said, it's not for surplus. It's operating oh, right. funds because we've seen some major cuts. I mean, there's some yes, we have. real issues. So it's been a good thing. It's been a Let me just tag on to that, do, that for a minute that, that relates to graduate studies. You know, we have right now uh, close to 100 graduate assistants. Okay. Those are not just people who are given a free ride. Oh. To, to do nothing. Right. They serve such critical roles on this campus. They do. They serve as assistant coaches. Mm -hmm. They work in the counseling center. They work in residence life. They recruit for the grad school. They work in academic departments. They do a lot of things. They teach that are, courses. They teach <laughs> courses. They c conduct science labs. They do all kinds yes. of things that enrich the life of the university. And uh, the money to pay for that has to come from someplace too. That's true. You know? That's so, true. So when we talk about generating funds, it's to support scholarships for students. Mm -hmm. It's to mm -hmm. support um, the, the everyday work life of the university. Sometimes to, it's, it's to enrich faculty development, uh, right. to support our centers. Well, and, and things, things like endowed chairs. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you talk about scholarships, that's, I mean, there's a lot of students that wouldn't go would not Certainly. be able to attend college if they didn't have Certainly. those. So that's been a very good thing. We had a girl come by the uh, graduate school yesterday, a young lady, and she said, I want to go to school, but I can't go to school unless I can get an assistantship. And uh, we found out what her field is. When do you want to start? Well, if I can get one right away, I'll start in the spring. If not then, I'll start in the summer. If not then, I'll start in the fall. Wow. Whenever you can go. find a way for me to get some money to get in, I want to go to school. That's sure. great. So it's, there are a lot of students that are in that, that in that place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think we've come to a good point to take a break. Okay. And uh, I just want to let you know that you're watching the Education Forum, Season 5. We'll be back right after this. We're back in Education Forum. I'm Jeff Conklin here with Greg Blaylock and our special guest, Dr. Ellen Roberts, who is the Interim Assistant Vice President for Academic Affairs here at Columbus State University. 
And before the break, we were talking about graduate education here, and we want to continue in that vein. What kind of new programs are coming out of the provost's office for graduate education? And okay, well, first, new programs don't really come out of the provost's okay. office. They okay. end up there, I guess, and they get sent forward. But new programs come from departments All right. and All right. colleges. All right. and, then, and then they move forward for the university to make decisions about and, and the provost ultimately mm -hmm. to sign off on. And, okay. And, uh, and then I send it forward to the Board of Regents. But um, there are a lot, of, a lot of exciting things going on right now. The, the ones we have approved, the new programs we have approved most recently, uh, there are two uh, certificates okay. in nursing okay. at the graduate level. Both of them are online. Uh, they are uh, a nurse educator certificate okay. and a health informatics I remember certificate. that one, yes. And yes. Uh, the health informatics was one of those that the community was really asking for. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. another way in which we responded to a specific need okay. that was coming from, from that population. Okay. Can tell, tell us a little more what that is, health informatics, for those that aren't familiar with the term. Well, as you know, throughout education, we're dealing more and more with data and information, and, and it's the same thing in the healthcare industry. And it's not just nursing, but all sure. aspects of healthcare, where they're really using information um, in, in new ways. Sure. Uh, and, and I wish I had the expertise to tell you more, and I probably don't. But, <laughs> right, uh, right. Well, you know, when you think about the kind of information that's generated from the healthcare perspective, sure. it, there's so much of it there that, uh, that can go unused if mm -hmm. we have people that really don't know how to put those pieces together and use it efficiently. And so it does make sense that graduate programs around informatics, I think, are, are popping up all over the country. Right. And you've seen such changes there, too. I mean, you go to your doctor now, and there's not the paper files. Right. Everything's electronic, and, and you're amazed. You go from one doctor to another, and they can pull up your entire record. They've got it right there. And, right. Um, so uh, they need that expertise. Great they really do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're doing that in nursing. What else are we seeing? Any other things uh, coming down the pipe that sure. you can talk about? So one, of, one of the recent additions is from the Command College. Oh, sure. uh, okay. Right. Master okay. in uh, Public Safety okay. Administration. Okay. That one's just getting started. Uh, and an exciting program, I think, that's uh, about to come to us in the curriculum committee okay. uh, this week. Uh, we have had a master's in environmental science, and that program is going to evolve now. It's going to change a little bit. So that we'll have a master's degree in the natural sciences, okay. and we will have tracks in environmental science, in biology, and in geology. Wow. And having those additional graduate level programs mm -hmm. in the sciences, I think, is really important. And as you know, for education, it's important, too, since we it offer is. graduate uh, graduate teaching degrees right. in those fields, and too. They need that and they'll have that strong content preparation. Yes. Uh, and they'll obviously have uh, a lot of things in the pure sciences that we'll draw from it, That's too. That's great to hear. I think it is critical, there. especially yeah. when you consider CSU's um, uh, focus in STEM programs over the exactly. last couple of years, um, taking more of a front seat. And exactly. so the, the ability to bolster our graduate programs in the sciences, I think this goes hand in hand, in hand with that. Yeah. So what kind of initiatives or support comes out of the provost's office for programs, graduate programs? What do we have there? Well, there are a number of, of things, I guess. One is the recruiting aspect, trying okay. to bring students into those programs. Okay. Um, what are we doing recruiting? In the past, what we have done with recruitment is go to recruitment fairs mm -hmm. and hold something here for the community and something else for the students. Okay. Um, one of the things I'm trying to do this year is put in a team approach to recruitment. Okay. And to make it a little bit more strategic. Uh, we ha don't have any data about the success of going to various mm. fairs, and okay. I want to be able to collect that. Sure. But also, on the front end, what we're do doing is looking to see at those recruitment fairs, what undergraduate uh, programs do they have that are large? Where are they turning out a lot of large undergraduates? Uh -huh. Where we uh -huh. have graduate programs. Okay. Mm -hmm. And okay. we are asking people then to, to consider going and joining us as a part of a recruitment team for a fair. Sure. So that we had sense. a meeting just recently um, focused on training some of the people who are interested. And we had uh, representatives from education mm -hmm. and from business and from the MPA program. And uh, I'm leaving somebody out one more. <laughs> but anyway, we're, we're developing that, that approach. Okay. Business, okay. did I say them? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. 
And, and that's great because uh, I think as, as for a university, as you recruit uh, students outside of your traditional geographic area, you, you really enrich the university itself because you oh, see yeah. a greater diversity yes. in, in the people and how they think about things, uh, which only bolsters the graduate work that goes on. The, uh, the person who is responsible for graduate recruitment or graduate admissions is Kristen Williams. And okay. I don't know if you know that she also does now international recruitment. Ah. So she'll be spending most of the le next month out of the country. Okay. And okay. she'll be recruiting international students for us at both the undergraduate and graduate right. levels. Right. And so we anticipate that that's going to further enrich the absolutely. diversity that we oh, already absolutely. have at this institution. Yeah, so that's, that's, so that's I think that's an exciting undertaking. It is. Uh, we're in the process of developing new flyers. Okay. Um, get something that's more cohesive and, and kind of. Get it out there. A little bit glitzy, I guess. Okay. Polished. How's that? Polished. Very yeah. good. Yes. It, yes. So uh, we have some things that are underway like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it sounds exciting. And things evidently, are the studio is willing to help us develop a nice video for well, promotional <laughs> purposes, also. So. And, and that you know that's been in the works, and he's eager sure. to do it. So I mm -hmm. think that's a good idea. Um, the other thing you may ask about support for programs. Yes. Of course, the the. The graduate school also works with the graduate council, okay. which has representatives from various um, the various colleges and programs, and with a graduate director's assembly, which is all the program directors. So there's an information exchange mm -hmm. here where we're talking about what are your needs and what can we do, okay. and where we're bringing up issues that may need to be resolved. We have students coming in that don't meet these requirements. What do we want to do about you know all sure. kinds of things that come up like that? We look at policies and make decisions about those. Uh, the Graduate Council actually reviews and approves new programs of study before okay. the University Curriculum Committee does. Mm -hmm. So there's some oversight to that. Uh, we look at um, the process of approving faculty to teach the graduate level, the graduate yeah. faculty graduate membership. Faculty. Sure. Uh, so that and that's been an is issue over place. the last uh, several years about who's eligible to teach graduates. Classes. Absolutely, and we have our standards, but they're based on SAC standards. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're we're making sure that we're just that, not making it up from that. Our, <laughs> that the people that teach our graduate students are highly qualified. Yes, to okay. use use the P twelve term, but it applies nonetheless. We don't get away from that, do we? No, we don't. <laughs> okay, now you mentioned the Command College. For those that don't know, what is the Command College? Um, it's its own entity. Okay. Okay. <laughs> The Command College is a very unusual, um, an, an unusual group in that they draw from all kinds of expertise okay. from the law enforcement profession, all right. okay. and they bring in people from all over the state, and I'm sure outside the state even, that have expertise, whether it's homeland security, mm -hmm. whether it's whether it's law enforcement administration, whatever it is. Okay. And uh, they have uh, a justice administration track okay. in the MPA program. They have this new public safety administration degree. Right. So they are, and, and again, filling another need where the region has one. And that's just not here. That's all over the state. That's you all see it is. Cars it is. It's all everywhere. over the state. Yes. Right, right. So We've talked is. a little bit about that with our chief of police, Russ Drew, in the right. past in, in terms of their work mm -hmm. with the command college. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, how valuable that's been. So, yeah. Okay, where do you see the future in graduate education here? One of the interesting things, one of the perhaps unfortunate things, I guess, is it's anticipated in the near future that there will be either flat or declining enrollment in all of education at higher in higher education. Okay, okay. And that's because there are fewer graduates predicted coming out, coming out of high schools also. Okay. So our population And that's a population shift. Okay. Yeah, that's a population okay. shift. Okay. And and that means that we've got to be um, smarter about how we go about doing business mm -hmm. uh, in terms of recruitment if we want to bring bring, bring people in. Okay. Um, selling ourselves, letting people know why we're better than others are perhaps okay. as a choice for graduate education. Uh, but it also means we've got to be better at retaining the people we have and getting them to graduate. Okay. Uh, that's that's keeping, a big thing nowadays, isn't enhancing it? Enhancing our own reputations, keeping the quality of our faculty, our research and scholarship up so mm -hmm. that people want to make this a good choice. I think in the near future what we'll see is this continued emphasis on strategic design. Okay. Or, 
strategic selection of graduate programs to meet the needs? Where do we have large undergraduate programs okay. that make sense? Mm -hmm. to develop graduate programs in. We did that recently with Exercise Science, okay. which has a very large undergraduate population, and here sure. we are in our first semester That's right. with a graduate That's right. degree in that field. We're looking at that possibility with health science, certainly. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening with biology, as I mentioned. Right. So those are pretty st strategic kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. also have to know that at the same time, our Board of Regents, our governing body, is telling us that we need to look also at whether there are programs that need to be deactivated because they're not turning out okay. very many uh, graduates. Sure. Maybe there's not enough need. We're using resources mm -hmm. the state sure. provides, and we need to use those wisely. So we're being asked to take a look again at the enrollment of all of our okay. programs of study and to have a certain number of graduates in each one of them. And if you don't have the number? If we don't have the number, first of all, we come up with a plan. Okay. If we, if we want to make the case that we believe in this program, we believe in its value to the community, okay. uh, can we work to graduate more students, or can we justify keeping it even though it's low enrollment? Right. Okay, sure. And in a high the needs field, yeah. we may need to do that. Yes, right. yes. So I, I was at the Board of Regents last week when this topic was discussed, and it's going to be on the agenda again next, next okay. month. But they, they pointed out that it's not just number of graduates or just enrollment that's important about a program, and they realize that. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at much that's more good. than yeah. enrollment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Why should a graduate student come to Columbus State pursue a graduate All degree? right, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, one of the real reasons, of course, is you are getting quality education here. Okay. You, are, you are coming into programs that are accredited. As you know, everything in education is accredited. Yes. Nationally yes. accredited by NCATE, or mm -hmm. counseling programs accredited by KCREP. We have programs in the arts that are accredited. We okay. have programs in business that are internationally accredited. The, the uh, MBA program is. Okay. So that's something this institution believes in, mm -hmm. and, and that's what's happening with, with our graduate degrees. We have intentionally, I think, and especially looking at my history here in the past several years okay. and since the addition of our doctoral degree, mm -hmm. we have intentionally focused on the quality of faculty with regard to scholarship when we hire them. Yes. We have always focused on teaching, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. always focused yes. on teaching. We still focus on teaching. I still tell you that when I interview people, I say, if you are not committed to teaching, you don't need to be here. Excellent. But you've Excellent. also got to be a scholar. That's and true. And you've got to provide service to the institution. Of course. In your field. But, but so, we are a teaching university. Uh, but we are a teaching yes. university and who it, also think, now does research and right. scholarship and And I think it is service. important to point out that uh, a lot of people may not realize that not all universities focus on the same types of things. And there are universities out there that are not necessarily teaching universities. Um, they do other things well, um, but their primary focus is not necessarily teaching like it is here uh, as, a, as a piece of also doing scholarly work. I would say, too, that not all universities approach providing graduate education in the same way. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And, and one of the things that we have done very well at CSU is provide hands-on practical experience mm -hmm. to students mm -hmm. and that started sure. with undergraduate education mm -hmm. but it continues through graduate education and it's not just in the field of education but more broadly. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed listening to one of our biologists and geologists talk about how their programs will be different from other graduate programs that are fo so focused on classroom learning and theory mm -hmm. and how much they embrace field work Beautiful. and sure. going out and getting samples and doing things, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very characteristic of a lot of our uh, programs at, at CSU. Mm -hmm. uh, we, of course, do try to support students through scholarships and yes. through graduate assistantships and other kinds of programs when we can. And I'd say one of the, the real draws is it's a great campus in terms of the feel, the collegiality. Sure. People yeah. like each other. They like working together. We're yeah. in a community that embraces us they and do. supports us. And, and you guys probably know as much as I do about what Columbus itself has to offer. Yes. Sure. Right. Having right. just added 
white water, but having great, <laughs> yes, yes. great arts programs, great recreation well, and programs And downtown here. has done so much. And downtown with us, with that is flourishing. Large yes. Sure, there are all of those kinds of things. So I think there are a lot of reasons why why Columbus State is a really good choice good, for graduate good. school. Mm -hmm. um, now, you've been here 27 years. Mm -hmm. What kind of evolution have you seen in the whole university in that 27 years? Uh, when I came, I would say we were almost totally an undergraduate institution. Okay, and yeah. it's not that there weren't graduate programs here and there, especially in education, but the university considered itself an undergraduate institution, okay. and that has been changing. Just a, a little bit above a junior college or community college. Maybe, maybe. so, okay. and, 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 and certainly then we, we moved from being a college from the time I was here to being a university. Okay. You know? okay. And um, I, I think another really significant change, in addition to our becoming doctoral degree granting which and major. the change in scholarship expectations, which is huge. Mm -hmm. Another one is this move to online education. Okay. And uh, Isn't everybody doing that? You know, no. Okay, okay. <laughs> and, and some people are doing only that. Okay. And, and we have mm -hmm. a nice mixture, I think, of really great face-to-face -face instruction, but now really great online instruction as well. Okay. I, I think that's key uh, right there is really great online instruction. Uh, a lot of uh, people don't understand, perhaps, that it takes a lot of work to, uh, to have good online instruction. The skills are very different from face-to-face -face instruction. The technology is very different. And so while a uh, university might provide online instruction, it doesn't necessarily mean it's engaging, it's interactive, it's rigorous in terms of the coursework. And, and this is one of the things the provost's office is trying to work with faculty on and work with programs and deans on, and that is making sure that we get faculty who are trained right. with every tool uh, that they can be trained in to enhance their instruction. You right. know, we've been doing the Quality Matters, and yes. we've done other yes. kinds of training. We're, we're providing the, the software and things to enhance instruction. Mm -hmm. So that's something we really want, want to, to have take place, that, that the quality is never questioned. Right. Uh, I'm amazed at the number of faculty that tell me how much teaching online has changed their mind about the value of online mm. learning. Okay, I'm sure. I had okay. one person tell me, I chose to teach online because I believed I was going to find out why we, we it needed to be opposed. Mm -hmm. Didn't really believe in it. And yes. she said, yes. I can't believe how rich it can be. Right. You know? So it's a, it's a testimony like that that I'm hearing. Okay. I had the, the privilege of being in a position to be an advocate for uh, education health professions first online collaborative degree. Mm. Okay. And there were okay. a lot of questions raised at the time. I would imagine. And sure. then a great deal of buy-in. Um, it, it took a while. It, yeah. it, it, it did. It, yeah. it took a while and I had to be honest and say I have reservations but I can tell you if there's not quality in this program I'm going to be the one who's also opposing it. Yes, you know? I remember and those I haven't words. Had, yes. I haven't had to do that because we have consistently had faculty who are invested in their teaching, whether they're a full-time faculty or people who teach part-time for us. Mm -hmm. As you guys know, you're involved right. with online yes, we are. program right now, yes, too. We, we have several of those in education. We have them in other fields. Some mm -hmm. of them are collaborative, the nursing, the business, oh, yeah. special education, teacher leadership, educational leadership, computer science, uh, one of the tracks of the MPA program. There okay. are a lot of online options oh, there at Columbus State there University. Are. So and, that was uh, a change from when you that, came. That's a huge change. Yeah. That yeah. is a huge change. How about numbers in 27 years? Have they increased? I, I think at the time that I came, we were at 3,000 and something. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. So, so a little bit of growth. So we've <laughs> had a good bit of growth yes, in that we time. Have. Yeah. A lot of new buildings in that time. We have, well, there wasn't a downtown campus. I was going to say, a whole new campus. Sure. That's, right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and, and the new building's on campus. Mm -hmm. The uh, Center for Commerce and Technology mm, wasn't yes. here. The Cunningham Center wasn't here. Uh, the sure. the Lumpkin, Lumpkin wasn't Center here. wasn't right. here. Even Lenore wasn't here. Okay. So these, okay. the older buildings, the one we're sitting in, <laughs> right, right. and some of the others just, just didn't exist. So we've had a lot of expansion. The campus has stayed uh, a beautiful campus, I think. In spite of growth and change, sure. they've intentionally worked to try to keep it 
you know, a place that people right. want to be. And a lot now, of now what about space. the field? We were at one time considered almost a commuter campus, weren't we? I mean, we didn't have a lot of residents. We were, and that's another, that's another good change, yeah. is with the addition of dormitories and apartments yes. and the downtown lofts, uh, we're, we're bringing more and more students on campus, and there are plans to continue with that kind of expansion. Okay. As we bring in um, more international students, that'll be important. As we recruit yes, more will. and more people from outside the region, mm -hmm. that's important. Oh, it will so, be, and, yeah. And, and we know it's important from a student perspective in terms of education to be living uh, on campus, how much richer their campus, yes. their university <laughs> education Absolutely. can be, because they're living, working, breathing um, higher learning uh, by living on campus. It's a whole different experience. That's exactly yes, it is. right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think one of the things we're trying to figure out where the graduate school is concerned is is what that means for a graduate student. You know, if you uh, think sure. about who uh -huh. our students are, they're really in two different groups. Mm -hmm. So we've got the undergraduate student who finishes, maybe doesn't get a job, or just likes education so much and comes back. Okay. And that person enters and is going to be consciously thinking, what can I job, kind of job can I get when I exit here? Sure. What opportunities? Where do I go? How yeah. do I network? And, and have those kinds of needs. And then we've got, especially I think in education and business, people who are in established careers, mm -hmm. but they want to enhance their, their education, sure. improve their job skills, get pay bumps, whatever right, the right. Motiva all, all various those motivations yes. are. Yeah, and we have that population, and many of them are uh, parents, and uh, again, they've got the jobs, yes, and yes. they have kind of different needs. Mm -hmm. So supporting those two populations is what we're trying to figure out. I've been meeting a little bit with uh, Gina Sheiks, who's okay. Vice President of Student Affairs. They are conducting a survey with graduate students with the help of the Social Science Research Center, which by the way falls under uh, okay. my responsibilities <laughs> also right now. And uh, the survey is to kind of to determine what are the graduate students participating in? What services do they make themselves? Okay. What, which ones are they involved in? What would they like to be involved in okay. that they're not? Uh, and then maybe have some focus group follow-ups to see where we need to go. Excellent. What, what Excellent. kind of participation can we get? What needs do they have? That's great. Well, I'm going to have to stop the discussion right here. Okay. Uh, I've enjoyed being We've run out you. of time. <laughs> um, we'd like to have you back sometime because there's, a, you know, we have a lot of area we could cover. Sure. But yeah, there will uh, be updates, I know. I'm <laughs> sure there will be. So I'd just like to thank our guest today, Dr. Ellen Roberts, and thank you for watching Education Forum.